live. And <laughs> it always happens. Always happens. Hello, I'm Dr. Chris. And I'm Alan Chatney. And this is the Source Points Podcast, where we talk about all things geoscience, uh, movies, news, geoscience, whatever seems whatever, to come up. Whatever yeah. comes up. We have a guest today. Yeah, joining us today is Dennis Ellison. Dennis, welcome. Welcome. So why don't you introduce yourself to, uh, to us and to the folks who are listening in? Yeah, sure. Um, Dennis Ellison. I'm born and raised in Calgary, which uh, apparently is a rare really? thing. Really? Okay. Yeah. Join the club. I'm, I'm, I'm a member of that oh, club as so well. Oh, so am I. Uh, other than my time in Australia. Well, I don't feel as special anymore. <laughs> <laughs> really? You're you born not. In, I didn't know that about you, Chris. You're born and raised Calgarian. Yeah, and then I, then I did my PhD in uh, Curtin. Spent seven years there. It was fun. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, sorry, continue. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, and then uh, found geophysics after I went to university. I got in and was in the geology courses and found out that uh, through discussion with a lot of professors that that's where my questions were headed. And she was like, you should talk to the, to the rock nerds. I was like, all right, let's go. And so, that's how I found that and quickly discovered it. I was like, oh, I could get a degree after my undergrad. This is pretty sweet. So, and then one thing led to another. Uh, worked for a few years at Thrust Bell Imaging. Uh, went back to do my master's, did a stint at Devon Energy, and right now I'm at uh, SoundQI, and I defended my thesis in September and mm. had everything all finalized in October. Thesis at a master's level? At a master's, at a master's level nice. at UC Good with uh, Cruz. Cool. Oh, so, nice. Cruz, so my old you, stomping ground. Are yeah. you officially a master of geophysics now? This is the debate I've been trying to find. Am I done because I've defended, or do I have to confer, or... I What's put it on verdict? my signature. What's the verdict, uh, PhD holding uh, Dr. Chris? No, How in Australia it? it was different. I didn't have to defend, which I only found out halfway through my program, which was kind of weird. So I just had to finish a very long thesis, and that was, that was it. So I, don't, I can't speak for the UFC, unfortunately. But you probably have to get your piece of paper. Right? Well, I, everything's been approved and submitted. Right. right, it's in the vault. It, I've been accepted. I've been accepted for the conferral. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. And um, so, 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 tell us about what's happening now. SoundQI, you guys are doing some cool stuff with uh, inversion and rock properties, and I mean, I just yeah, yeah, we're doing we're doing lots of cool stuff. So we, uh, as you said, inversion for rock properties, um, but it's also what is the meaning of that? So we do a lot of rock physics modeling and to get templates so that we can understand what, um, when we look at the elastic attributes, what does that mean geologically? And we, the method that we do that is in a cross plot space. So you can look at multiple attributes at the same time to figure out what the mineralogy or lithology or, or fracture intensity or whatever property of interest you're trying to find out. So we do that. And then we also incorporate into our classification software, QI Pro, to be able to um, iteratively and interactively um, update those models to refine that with the geology and the wells and the um, so that you can have a confidence in your in your subsurface model hmm. so that's so and what are you seeing in terms of uptake and openness to that in the local and international markets like are you seeing differences in terms of people who are in the exploration space or the development space you know how what who 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 are your key sort of uh, clients and what are what are they what are they using it for I think our key clients are the ones who are really um, integrated with other disciplines. They, they actually, I think, and I think it's because they're the ones that see the, the barriers to communicating geophysics to other people, right? If you're a geophysicist and all you're talking to is geophysicists, everybody's kind of on the same page when they're working, looking at wiggles. But when you're trying to tell people that this wiggle means uh, porous sandstone or this wiggle means a, a tight shale or a gas field shale, uh, engineers and geologists, they don't like that. They don't understand that. And so they either have to educate themselves on that, and, but, or you can take uh, a tool like QI Pro and be like, okay, and you can go through and you classify it and be like, okay, sandstone, our target's yellow or our target's red. And you can go through, it's like, hey, I've done this physics. I've, I've correlated everything and I've matched it and now it's robust. And here's what I'm showing you on the cross plot. Here's where it shows in the mm -hmm. spatial domain. Right. And now engineers are like, okay, drill the reds. Right. And it's like, perfect. <laughs> Excellent. <the> red. <laughs> you have to speak engineerese. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. So, okay. And, and what are you seeing? Because like, the thing we've been working on intensively here has been all around um, better quality seismic data. So, so higher frequency, broader bandwidths, greater trace density, 
better spatial sampling resolution across the board. Do you, when you do the work that you do, do you, do you think, okay, actually what we've got is fine. The historical data works great. Or do you, are you left sort of going, oh man, I wish we could have a bit more resolution, a bit broader bandwidth and, you know, better, that would help your characterization of the subsurface. Yeah, absolutely. Um, broader bandwidth um, and, and on both ends of the spectrum, like even the low frequencies. As if you can push those low frequencies into the seismic data, mm -hmm. that really helps mm -hmm. the inversion as well. Um, but also the higher frequencies because you get more resolution and, and measurement and you don't have other issues like tuning thickness and um, resolvability issues. Uh, but there's uh, uh, any technology you can prove that will enhance the seismic data will enhance other technologies down the line as well. So if you can get better st spatial sampling, you'll, ha you'll be able to measure the spatial variation um, in a much more distinct way rather than averaging over a bin size. If you can get um, better, better frequencies and better sampling, then you can ha improve your vertical resolution as well and you won't be inhibited by that and you can get more detail. And some of those problems are easily, I think, overcome with technology. Um, from As I continue to learn more, it seems like there's also just geologic constraints. There's the earth frequency model that limits some things, but you also do other things to try to overcome that. There's a lot of spectral whitening methods that um, often up for debate about its value and its use, but depend if you're using it right and if you understand the limitations, why not? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, and so what do you think, do you think like because what's what we've talked about quite a bit is just the challenges that have befallen the seismic industry, especially here in Canada, over the last four or five years. What do you think is holding us back? Because if you can do all these great things with the data, and you can you can speak to the engineers and different disciplines, and you know drill the reds or don't drill the yellows or whatever you you're saying, why is it that everybody isn't using data that way? Why why is it that that we haven't seen you know, people saying, okay, I absolutely have to have the best seismic I can get, and I have to do the, the inversion work and understand rock physics, and what's holding us back? Why aren't people, I mean, maybe you guys are busier than anybody, but, you know, broadly speaking, we could be a lot busier, I think, in our industry. Yeah, and definitely in Canada, I one thing I'm beginning to see because we have a presence in the U.S. is that there's also like a cultural difference when it comes to geophysics in Canada and the U.S. And I think it also comes to uh, technology um, in its application as well, where I feel like um, when, I, when you talk to people in Canada and you talk to them about advanced technology, there's like a panel of 15 people that you have to justify it to with a broad range of background and you're just like and everybody has to get buy-in and anybody can almost shut it down sometimes now that's a very extreme case but that actually sounds like pipeline approval <laughs> <can't>. <laughs> yeah. oh no don't yeah. go there not yeah. yet not that's, yet. that's for early. later Too, on yeah. in the podcast but, but i see what you mean okay, but in so. the u.s there's more uh, readiness and acceptability for adoption i think people are more able and accepted to fail when after trying something and, and so you talk to a few people and they're like, yeah, that's great. Let's try this. And you go ahead and you do it. Whereas up here, people have to be sure it's not going to fail before they're okay doing it. And I think that's really impediment to innovation, to growth, and to adoption of new technology because you can never know how it's going to work. And often you're, you're pivoting along the way of the road of innovation to n realize where it's actually going to apply and maybe where you intended it to apply isn't where it's going to go, but it's somewhere else. But you don't know that until you take that leap of faith and try it and investigate and see what the actual results are. That's absolutely true. We've seen that in our, in our innovation as well, where you have to fail. And sometimes the whole thing is, let's go out there and try, because if it's going to fail, then we'll know that right away, and then we won't do that anymore. Yeah. And then we'll try the next thing. And then that's actually how discovery happens. You know, like I've read that I think Edison had to, I'm going to get this wrong, but he, I think he had like, some hundreds of different designs for the light bulb mm -hmm. before he finally settled on the one that became the dominant design that, that kind of generally worked and that we knew up until everything went to LED light bulbs here yeah. recently. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and even learning about a lot of entrepreneurs and their approaches, and there's one guy, I think, uh, he was the one who, um, the founder of Airbnb. He He's like, I had like four or five different iterations of Airbnb. He's like, but they all failed. He's like, but the great thing about them failing is that they never went anywhere, so nobody knew about it. Right, because they failed, and so by the time Airbnb did work, everybody's like, "You're amazing, you're brilliant." He's like, oh, "No, I just finally found one that worked." Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you're brilliant because mm -hmm. you failed a whole bunch of times. But nobody knows that because right. they failed, and, and never nobody cared. 
so they moved on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I've seen too, like you talk about failure, there's a, a, a kind of part of the culture, which is not just necessarily a Canadian thing, I think. You know, when you go to conferences and you go to, um, you know, the SCG, uh, you go to the CSEG, you go to the APG, whatever conference, the papers that are presented tend to be about, hey, look, it worked out really well and it was great, right? Very seldom do you see papers presented about stuff that we did and actually it didn't work at all. So, you know, don't do this, right? But we oh, did actually yeah, see that one. Was at, we did uh, see, the, see one in, uh, in Anaheim. Was that, that was, it was Tim Dean's one about the... Uh, their subwoofer source. Their subwoofer. No, the subwoofer source worked. It was that weird, massive, like twenty thousand volt coil <laughs> that was like right. you know one they, slip up in your either, and your zap. Yeah. It was like a thousand amps oh, or really? something. It, it was it. ridiculous. Yeah, but that I loved. I loved Tim Dean's presentation. You're right. It was Tim Dean from Curtin, uh, and he was presenting on different sources that they've been seismic sources that they've been trying. He talked about a whole bunch that didn't work at all. Like, yeah, that, that was a scary like, one. It was like a scary, <laughs> don't do it, like science project. And I think that we could do with more of that because it would, especially if you're right about the whole Canadian U.S. culture shift, fear of failure thing, people sharing those failures would actually be really, really good, right? Like, hey, we tried this and it failed completely and utterly. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it takes It has courage. to have a good story. Otherwise, it just sounds really bad. It just sounds like you don't know uh, what you're doing, right? Yeah, yeah and, and I think that's part of it, too, is the level of confidence to communicate to other disciplines um, as well. I, I don't know. Um, maybe it's just my generation kind of thing where we're coming up to that, where um, even we're coming in, we're like, okay, we're using all this amazing technology that's been built on for the last 70 years. And so we weren't part of the that development of, like, that where like Larry Line, Sam Gray, um, John Clairbaut were all a part of this as it came up and we're just coming in and we're implementing these technologies. But now we're just using it and we're not going through the innovation and so we don't completely understand it sometimes. We're just, uh, I think a lot of us end up being button clickers without trying to understand. And so when it comes to new ideas and innovations and communication, we, it holds us back a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, and what we've seen uh, often is sort of preconceived notions about you know what can work and what and what won't, uh, you know, and it, it, it that's that's what failing and testing and failing quickly and trying new things it allows you to kind of test those theories. And every once in a while, we find something where it's okay. This works differently than we thought it did, or actually mm-hmm. works exactly the way everybody thought it did. Yeah, you know, either way. So pretty cool. Um, hey, I've, have you been involved in the JGF? Did we connect at the JGF? Were you there? Yeah, I, I, we, we chatted at the AG, yeah, JGF. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I talked to a lot of people out there. And, and what does the JGF stand for? JG, yeah, Chris and his uh, <laughs> acronyms. Acronym, we Chris can't say. The Junior Geophysics Forum. There we go. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, because we, our last podcast, in fact, was with uh, Matt That's Lennon right. and Nathan Fester talking about, which I loved the way they did that, by the way. I thought probably, it was fantastic. Uh, Those two guys are, are fantastic guy. I have much more respect for Matt Lennon now, too, him being able to uh, come in here. Like, I was listening to him. I was like... I actually enjoy just listening to the guy. I could have one-sided conversations with this guy all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. And now he'll be doing it with you. Yeah. Right? So that's pretty cool. Yeah. No, that, uh, well, that, uh, that's exciting. The other thing that it was, it was neat to see, and maybe this is something we could talk about that relates to, the, to, the, to that, that um, forum having an effect on another forum, which was the Chief Geophysicist mm. Forum. So you have the mm-hmm. Junior Geophysicist Forum and you have the Chief Geophysicist Forum. And actually, interestingly, at the last chief geophysicist forum that I that I attended, which was just God, less than a week ago, um, they did a similar thing where they had breakout rooms or mm. breakout groups. Nice. They put you know f- uh, flip charts up and yellow stickies, and all of a sudden, you know, because it, it, it normally these meetings are quite quite measured, and everybody sits in their chair and t- yeah. waits their turn to speak, and maybe doesn't. This this opened it right up, and I. I haven't actually had a chance to ask uh, the organizers of that if they drew that uh, idea from the JGF, but I'm, I'm, my strong suspicion is that they did. I do too. There were some pretty, uh, I know some people who are on the JGF, or C- Chief 
yeah, CGF. The CGF. Yeah, yeah. T Geophysics Forum who were present at the J at the Geo Junior Geophysics Forum. And so I, I wouldn't doubt if there is definitely some influence there. Yeah. And did, the other did it work in the case of it worked. It worked really right. well. Yeah, it did. It, I I'm sure that uh, Elaine Hansberger is the outgoing chair from Husky, is the outgoing chair. She's done a fantastic job this year. And um, it's uh, Ed, whose last name is gonna escape me. Uh, uh, anyways, from Sizewire, who's stepping in now to take over. And then the new... Ed Van Horn? Uh, no, no, no. I'm going to get it wrong here. Yeah, well. Right. Embarrassing moments in podcasts, well, folks. Well, this is where we, uh, we could do a pause and come back and nobody would know the <laughs> difference. <laughs> no, no, let's stay authentic. I, okay. I forget. <laughs> anyway, I, could see his, I can see his face, but I just can't. But, but uh, where I was going with that is that the uh, new vice chair, co-chair, who will be the chair next year, 2020, 2020, is Matt Ng, who is also, I think of Matt as a kind of a junior, but he's not a junior anymore, right? He's, no, he's still... He's, he's that next generation that's hitting, mm -hmm. hitting it and, and knocking it out of the park. It's yeah. pretty cool. And he's in that inter is interesting transition zone where he's transitioning from being perceived by that junior geophysicist, and I think a lot of people are recognizing him as, he's like, no, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's, he's a professional. You can... When it's almost like, oh, if Matt said it, I'll trust it, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So that's kind of neat to see all that, uh, all that stuff. Yeah, good movies. You guys seen any movies? Oh, oh we're are already we going we're, to movies or what? Are we doing movies? Uh, this is where we need like a transition. <laughs> In the news today, uh, I'm not sure what to talk about in the news today. Any, uh, any, any? Should we go controversial and talk about any? Uh, any political content that has arisen as of late, or do we steer clear of political content? Well, it was it, it we so if we want to, we'll wait on movies. Then we'll go into yeah. news. Um, the have you read anything interesting lately, Dennis? Uh, like books and stuff? No, like <laughs> news, current affairs. Oh, current affairs. Uh, I, I've been following up a little bit on that. Um, what is it? Huawei. Huawei. Um, oh, yeah, Huawei. Yeah, that's right. That's right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Fang. So, Fang. And just somebody. interesting to see how people are presenting that. Like, I watched an interview, and uh, um, one guy described the U.S. justice system as being merciful. I was like, oh, that was that was interesting. Merciful. Yeah, and he's like, oh, yeah, I'm sure she'll be fine with a merciful uh, justice oh, I, system Well, in the compared US. to the Chinese, where it's like. Uh, maybe. Maybe it was a, a qualitative statement rather yeah. than. Yeah. But. Uh, it's, it's interesting. There, there's something in the background with Huawei, for sure. Because various security agencies around the, the Western world, let's say Australia, you know, yeah. Europe, New Canada, Zealand, the yeah. US, New Zealand, are quite concerned about uh, some of that technology and what, uh, what the Chinese government might be doing with it. And it's, it was fascinating to see that take place with the Canadian uh, you know, police arresting and, and putting her in jail. I mean, she spent the weekend in jail. Uh, I haven't yeah. read what's happened today. Uh, I, I think today they're deliberating on whether or not they'll actually send her. She'll have like a defense lawyer and and whatnot. But it, that's the interesting thing is that like everybody's like, oh no, this this isn't something that we have against her. It's like whenever there's an extradition order, if someone comes across her land, like yeah, we'll we'll hold them on behalf of the U.S. and discuss this. Mm. But the the other thing is, um, if I remember correctly, she wasn't even trying to stop in Canada. It was just a layover to get to Mexico, and right. they say they got her on the layover. Right, but you have to. Oh yeah, so I wonder how that works in the Vancouver airport. If you have to kind of go through, well, you got to go through Canadian customs to get onto Canadian soil. So yeah, but if she was staying, yeah. Anyway, fascinating. Um, the other one that I read with great interest uh, was this whole thing with the gov uh, the uh, the uh, premier of New Brunswick encouraging uh, the resurrection of Energy East oh. Oh, with at Quebec, the premier's RPG. conference, and then yeah. the Quebec the premier of Quebec then stepping in and saying. Oh, oil has no social license in Quebec. And you just go, what? what? Like, pretty sure the last time I was in Montreal, people were buying gasoline, driving cars, using energy, using their petroleum products, plastics, cell phones, computers. Well, the Absolutely ins insane comment. And then they're bringing in oil from dictatorships yeah. in favor of Canadian <sighs> oil. And then right below that, is a little rant here, Right below that, uh, equalization payments are rising by $1.3 billion in favor of Quebec uh, next year mm. with the formula. I wonder where, where's the money coming from? 
the rest of the country. Oh, uh, where, where is it mostly coming from? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure Alberta is a contributor. I know we are a contributor to that. Well, so I guess on this pol- political side, so I'm also uh, on the board of a charity called Energy Minute. I don't know if you know Alex yeah. Schrag. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, Alex Schrag. You guys yeah. made some videos? Or yeah. got some videos made. Yeah, we, we, we make some yeah. videos. We uh, do infographics. And uh, recently, this last year, we got charitable status. And so uh, we can now issue tax receipts. And, oh, fantastic. And if your company does um, like any matching, that's allowed in this new um, structure now. But it's interesting doing that because we recently were um, uh, looking at energy infrastructure of Canada. And one, one of the things that we kind of posited is looking at the history and even starting in Quebec, like with the James Bay um, hydroelectric right, plant. Right, right. One of the things they did there is, um, now not me recognizing that I don't have all the information and details, but from what I read, when they built that, they had to flood, I think it was over 500 square kilometers of native hunting and foraging ground. Mm-hmm. Right, wow. and this is back in the, I think, either 60s or 70s, probably not consulted, but it, Canada itself has had... Uh, struggle with communi- uh, communicating with indigenous populations on energy issues and stuff and so it's like it but it produces 16 uh i'm gonna get this wrong is it megawatts probably of power maybe uh, gigawatts it's gotta be anyway it's, it's gotta be huge gigawatts. amounts of power so it's like okay there's a, that's a huge power and energy benefit but it came at a cost was that cost worth it and it's kind of going into and talking about other issues as well with the trans mountain pipeline and other things that we're pushing ahead he's like yeah there is a cost but is it worth it is can should people have an, a veto power just saying it's like no it will have this this percentage of damage or this percentage of chance therefore it can't go ahead at all or is there an acceptable rate of loss for whatever reason. Right, and those are those are complex discussions that take more than like a tweet or a headline to work oh, through, right? And that's yeah. that's the problem is that the you know, just starting from the place that, you know, Quebec sort of saying, well, oil's bad, which is basically the translation of yep. of, of what the premier of Quebec said. Uh, it it doesn't work. It's it's just a non it's a non-functional um, kind of approach. But by the way, just touching on so so you're involved with uh, Energy Minute, and so is Alexandria, and I just see that she's won some award for Young Women in Energy or something. She did, she, yeah. And I, this popped up on my LinkedIn feed, and I was like, oh, that's fantastic for Alexandria to, to sort of achieve that, and, and so what do you know about that? I, I wish um, I could recall it a lot better than I do right now, but yeah, she's definitely um, among a number of recipients who've made a significant p- impact in their local communities and energy. There's a number of lawyers, engineers, geoscientists, and the, um, they, these, these are women that had significant pa- impact in, um, who are related to the energy industry um, uh, that they've had. And so Alexandra is fantastic. She's on a number of boards. She participated um, in this huge um, uh, federal discussion with a, a bunch of indigenous groups about energy policies across Canada. So she's um, learning a lot and applying a lot, and it's a great benefit for Energy Minute, which uh, she helped co-found um, as well. So it's, uh, yeah, she's, I wish I could recall more about what that ward yeah. is about because it was fantastic. Well, well and the other thing is and, and um, is, is to watch that progression, which is actually kind of connected back to the question of geophysics because, of course, she's a geophysicist, right? She came out of, out of school, went in as a, as a junior geophysicist or GIT, I suppose, but now, because of all this interest and work in sort of the energy picture and the big and the big picture, uh, she now works in I think stra- strategy and planning as an analyst mm. in strategy and planning. So not yeah. even geophysics, but I guess taking that analytical approach and that that understanding of the earth and energy and physics, how that all works. Well, and and especially on work, the energy right? policy and the bureaucracy on the provincial and federal side of things too. It's like I, like because she's with Chevron, it's like what is Chevron's future planning. I'm sure she's getting even more to just a year down the road, but they're probably planning 10 to 20 years right. as well. Right. That's, that's pretty cool. And what, uh, what, uh, what I think is fantastic is that, that leadership and, and leadership by example of, look, as scientists, we got to speak out in favor of the energy that we help find, right? Mm-hmm. And, yep. and, I, and I really would challenge, uh, you know, folks who are listening in to, to take to take that initiative and get out there and be vocal about it in some way, it turns out you can have quite an impact, uh, as we're seeing, right? So yeah, that's kind of cool. well, and that's one of the reasons why she founded 
um, Energy Minute is because there's this section which um, we refer to as the silent majority, right? You get the polarized right, the polarized left, but there's the silent majority who want sensible results. They they want energy stuff to move forward, but they also want it to do it in, in a way where you are consulting. And so that's one of the things that she saw to move forward is like we need to address this and provide material for these people that so that they would have content that they could rely on. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. No, it's really cool. What have you been watching, Chris? Oh, news -wise? Are watching Newswise. Uh, I'm trying to think now. Uh, okay, you went to the Huawei, or sorry, not what, was it called again? Huawei, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, uh, I've just been thinking, uh, my, my politics gets a little, little, little different in there because uh, I've been looking at this uh, from a different angle with, uh, with the energy issue, and it seems to me it's a, it's, a, it's a weird situation where we in Alberta need to more ask, of our, ask ourselves, uh, what, what do we want out of this? Right. It's like Quebec can just say, no, you're not traveling through our space. And a province can stop another province from from. Right. We saw the same thing in B.C. In exporting. Way, right? And it's it, it, we're, we're, we're sitting here talking, you know, you guys are sitting there saying, well, there's a silent majority. And it's like, I don't know if people really care what what we in Alberta say. We could have the best scientists, which we do to to give us the, this information. And I take my, you know, I'm, I don't get political too often uh, because I don't, it gets me all riled up and crazy like, but, <laughs> uh, which you haven't seen yet, but. Uh, it, Did you go to those rallies when Trudeau for, and for our, over here? I, 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 again, I'm, I've, because I've got a social media presence, I'm, I'm still sort of wary about how hard I need to, <laughs> that I'm gonna come out on this. But I, you know, you guys are talking about, you know, it, to me, it, this is all, it's, it's more of like, man, we in Alberta just need to say something sometime. We need to stand well, up. And, and I don't yeah. know if that's the conservative, like, tendency as well. Like, because even those rallies, yeah, there's lots of people there. But those were pretty docile rallies. In yeah, nothing like the yellow jackets in Paris. No, I'm sure most people bricks. were like, yeah, oh, like, oh, no, it's one o'clock. I get it back like to work. That today, right guys. there, I'm not saying that was a good thing. But obviously, Macron's... Uh, oh well, we're just gonna yeah. Let's ra let's raise the price of 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 fuel of everything of basically. everything. Like and as if you know why? Because we're gonna save the environment. How? Because we're raising the price and everything. Of course, people are gonna freak out. But here, it's not like that because no one's hitting the pocketbook yet. When well, we're hitting the pocketbook, but we're really polite. Yeah. And we're very patient. Well, I'm sure and Macron was, but here it's like I I don't. It's like. We've got this weird situation in Canada where one province can block another, can block another, and it's and some mm. I don't know I well I and and it's to that point and it goes across everything. Like I saw out of the first minister's conference that just closed last week, an agreement that uh, hey let's remove these interprovincial barriers to tran personal transport of alcohol. And you sort of go wait a minute. I brought wine back from BC lots of times. Was I was I breaking the law when I? when I bought wine in BC and brought it to Albert, you know, it's very strange, these barriers that exist uh, uh, across the country. So hopefully we can get some of those removed because it'll make us a better, stronger. Yeah, are yeah, we a country or are we a balkanized? I mean, I, yeah. I'm not sure if I said that on this po podcast, but every time that something like this happens, it drives me up the wall. Yeah. It's because uh, w when I was in Australia, there was, you know, there's each state has links to the sea. so. Western Australia never has to ask New, New, New South Wales, oh, could we transport our stuff? It's like, no. Mm. But here in Canada, it's like this weird, like, hey, BC, can we come through there? What? No? Yeah. But we're all going to make money on this. Right. Yeah. That's good. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Don't want to get too pop. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, Chris is good. For those of you that are just listening, and we don't have a video component to this yet, Chris was just doing his crazy eyes. He was oh, just doing I was his crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't form formalized, formalized it yet. But I'm getting a little uh, scared here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. You're making Dennis nervous. No, uh, are, are we? Are we? Uh, are we at, are we at uh, movie or book section now? No, we probably something? are. We probably we're at, are. We're, we're at, we're at 28 books. minutes, which is pretty good. So, yeah. uh, um, so I got, I got. Oh well, movies. you you watch a lot of movies, so my son is uh, my son is a movie goer. He 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 pushes this, and it's a really good thing. So. I, uh, you know, one of the things I can share is that I am a person, I'm not a, known as a sensitive, emotional person in my regular, everyday life. 
for some reason when I watch a movie, especially a really good movie, uh, tears you. will occasionally flow. It gets right, you right, right there. Right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, but anyway, so my son talks me into going to see A Star is Born. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh. The new one. Uh, like Lady the, apparently Gaga it's been done a few yeah. times. Yeah, yeah, Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga and Sam Neill. And I mean, if you have not seen this movie yet, you absolutely need to go see it. Uh, I'll be astonished if it does not win Best Picture. I'll be astonished. I'll be astonished if Lady Gaga doesn't win Best Actress and if Bradley Cooper doesn't win Best Director and Best Actor in this thing. Mm. Like this movie is one, it, it ends on a quiet thing so that the, the thing just goes quiet and the experience of being in a movie theater that's jam-packed and the movie ends and it's quiet and all you could hear is quiet and sniffling from people who are in tears is a hell of a thing that I, mm. I don't think I've really experienced before. Have you just uh, done uh, a spoiler on that? No, no spoiler. No spoiler. No spoiler. No. Other th- like there are many things that could cause that. It could be joy. It could be Ah, it could, be, it could be sadness. It could be anything in between. But uh, I will tell you, it is a fantastic movie. The acting is incredible. The music is incredible. Uh, it's it it was it's just not to be missed. If you only see one, it'd be the one. And and uh, it, it has a musical component. So you go, oh, musicals. I don't like musicals. It's it's a musical, but it's not a musical. It's not a singing you know, and dancing musical? It's not da, 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 your show tunes type uh, of thing. Oh, show tunes. Okay. Yeah, no, it's not like uh, Les Miserables or one of those that had like, sing, I'm going to sing all of a sudden. And this is like, know, like it's mob dancing <laughs> in the middle of the song. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So okay. anyways, so that, that I, I just had to rave about that. It's a fantastic uh, movie. Have you seen any movies lately? Actually, Netflix or anything? So on? got young kids at home, so we're not out very much. Christmas oh, movie Netflix. time. Yeah. Well, actually, we just watched The Matrix. <laughs> what? That's yes. not a Christmas movie. No. How no, young are your kids? Uh, five and a half, uh, four, and T minus 23 weeks. Oh, so you guys are in kids. a similar boat, right? That's okay. That And The Matrix for a five and a half year old? No, it, this was just me and my wife. <laughs> <after> <laughs> okay. okay. Was no, that like the first time you've ever seen it? You're like, <laughs> yeah. Holy cow, look at these computer graphics are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, my son and I, he just watched a show on Netflix called Rock Dog. Rock, rock. Yeah, yeah, it's a new one. Is he it? loved it. It was really funny. Um, definitely yeah. a kid's targeted show. So The Matrix is a pretty cool movie, eh? That's, uh, I just have a deeper appreciation for it now because I didn't understand computers all that well when I was a kid, but I still loved to talk about it. And even the uh, um, the belief system and, and like faith and everything else and like what is this life and the whole... Um, yeah, kind of the existential the philosophy of it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mythos yeah. of the matrix. Yeah, yeah. what's no. life about? What is the meaning of life? Yeah, yeah, those kinds of questions. Yeah, that's kind of cool. You take the red pill or the blue pill if yeah. you're in your shoes. Right? <laughs> mm. What do you do? Take them both. Yeah. Take yeah. them both? What, what's oh, going to happen? Pur- that purple pill. Yeah, yeah, I forgot the colors, but uh, huh, cool. And uh, you're, so you both, you both have wives who are expecting. This is incredible. Mm. 23 so, weeks? Uh, she's 17 weeks. Okay. Oh. Well, congratulations. That's exciting. Yeah, thanks. And you're... She's due in three weeks. Momentarily. Momentarily. Anywhere Christmas, from, baby. Hopefully not. We're <laughs> aiming for after New Year's. Uh, for uh, Just like Al has been saying, it's for uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, from a Malcolm Gladwell book, if, if you're born... If you're old for your... Oh, that's year, right. You want to be old. born in the early part of the year. Absolutely. Yeah. So are you a hockey fan then? I am not. Oh, okay. <laughs> but <laughs> it's still sport. It's any sports in general. Unless that's we true. go, Unless we go back to Australia and then it's... Then we're goofed, yeah, because yeah. it's everything's reverse. So I'd be young for for his uh, future, but it's also for school as well. If you're more mature in your unfortunately, I think when yep. the baby is ready to come, it's simply going to yes, yeah. yeah, just have very little you can do <laughs> he, about that. He's not planning his graduation day yet. No, yeah. or she. Yeah. No, it's definitely he. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, no, no, it's a Christmas movie time. So it's been Christmas movie three nights a week at. Uh, at the Harrison at, household. At the Harrison household, which is funny because uh, some, I remember watching those when I was a kid, of course, because they're, you know, yesterday's was uh, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, 1964. Oh, with the uh, animatronics thing yeah, or whatever it, those are. Uh, yeah, Rankin. Uh, it's a Rankin animation. And Something then, like then those was, little stuffed critters. Yeah, exactly. Around. And then there was uh, Frosty the Snowman, 1969. Uh, what else has there been? Do you watch the original Grinch then? 
Yes. Uh, Not the Grinch with both. Jim Carrey? We'll, we'll do both because it weren't the, the Grinch with Jim Carrey is pretty good. And the original Grinch is... Well, isn't there a new Grinch coming There is a new one. (laughs) (laughs) I I, want to say, unfortunately, my kids have seen the trailers and like, we want to see that. I'm like, okay, well. Yeah, so let's go to the movie theater and spend a hundred bucks to see the movie, right? Yeah, well, I I don't know how they can remake it again. It's like, there's a point in there where it just doesn't make any sense. But, of course, there's a whole bunch of other Christmas movies... uh, I don't know. Do you have Christmas movies on your list? Two of my favorites are, of course, The Christmas Story with the Red Rider, Carbon Action, Range Model, Air Rifle, with the Compass in the Stock, and The Thing That Tells Time. No, you guys don't know it. We don't know it. That's, that's out story. there. Christmas Story. Okay. And Lost us in the turns on that one, Chris. Damn. Can I say damn on this? You just did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, that's a great one. And I have to say this. It was hilarious. Um, uh, my wife had never seen it before. She was Australian, and it wasn't a thing in Australia. And I had seen it probably every year since I was old enough to watch a movie. So this was about like four years ago, we, or may I put five years ago, we're watching it. And I never realized how emotional it is until, you know, being with someone who's watching it for the first time. You know, it's, you know, it was like, oh, Zuzu's Petals. Oh, Merry, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, you know, and I was, you know, when I was a kid, I was like, oh, that's nice. And then my wife watching it, it was like tears. It was like, oh, this is, I was like, oh, okay. But that's <laughs> fantastic when a movie can do that to you. I mean, Absolutely. I really like that. I, I, I you know, I, I'm, as I say, I, that happens to me all. At first, my kids would always make fun of me, and I think sort of just <laughs> accepted it's a part of who yeah. I am now. I just, I get into it, right, so. My favorite Christmas movie is Home Alone. Oh, yes, we watched oh, those two. I forgot yes. about them those both. Are number fantastic. one and number two. And we don't talk about number three. I've no. never, we'll never see number three. I think yeah. there's a number four. I'm not quite sure. No, about. is there a number four? Yeah, I, I think it's like with a dog or something. It's like okay, yeah, they just tried milking it. It was horrible. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny because it was, we were, you know, my son and I, we were, he was, we're going through this 100 top movies list. So we watched Goodfellas the other night. Okay. Oh. And I love that movie. It's one of my yeah. favorite movies. And, and Joe Pesci in that thing is fantastic. And so then he, uh, he says to me, he goes, Dad, whatever happened to Joe Pesci? Where did he go? What's he, what's he doing? Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and then I realized, I think he was in the Home Alone movies. Yep. Uh, he, he was. was. And, I, and then I couldn't remember if Home Alone came before Goodfellas. And then where did Joe Pesci go after that? So then we looked him up on Wikipedia, and he just retired. Oh, really? And you think, you think Okay. So that happens, I guess. An well, actor you know, could just go, I'm done. I'm I forget retired. how long ago it was. Um, but there was a new TV show coming out, and like Jennifer Lopez was in it. And I was like, oh, look, she's working again. Looks like she needs some money. <laughs> right. And, and, and my wife was just like, I've never thought about it like that, that this is their job. Right. They got to go earn a living. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see if maybe one day somebody gets Joe. If anybody could do it, it would be Martin Scorsese or Robert De Niro mm-hmm. or something. They'll come out with something, a uh, uh, new movie, with, and then pull Joe out of retirement, right? Because he was, he was fantastic. <laughs> well, they, he just ended up always being the... He was short, the, the, Yeah, he was the uh, small man syndrome Italian mobster who... Or, or killed low-level crook in Home Alone or whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like he was one of those two guys. They did who, was ha- the, who was the other crook in that movie? Oh, who I see his face. Other? I can't remember his yeah, name. Do you remember? Marf. Marf, Marf yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny. Yeah, he, always, uh, he was in a, co- in a commercial, though. Joe Pesci was a pretty funny commercial. That was the Snickers commercial. No, oh. we are not sponsored by Snickers. <laughs> Oh, was Where that he was, recently? He was be, yeah, Where he was turned being, him into Joe Pesci? Yeah, yeah. yeah I was like, oh, yeah, what are you doing, man? I don't like being here. Yeah. And then here's have a Snickers. And it's like, oh, I feel better now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's funny. Are they still doing those ads? Snickers? No, probably not, actually. Who knows? It's been a while. But it's been a while since I've seen a commercial, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's a commercial? <laughs> yeah, with young kids and young families, you're not sitting there uh, watching a whole ton of TV. Probably. My kids loved commercials. Oh, like We had cable for now. a little bit, and they, they, uh, they would be upset if I fast-forwarded through commercials. Yep. Like, what I are you doing, Dad? I was watching that. We like, like watching commercials. Okay. It's like, what? You like watching commercials? As a kid, it was like, yeah. no. <laughs> you know, it's going to be interesting to see because commercials are, you know, you got to put them everywhere now. They're on your YouTube videos. They're on your... 
news, like you want to watch the news and see what happened with Huawei, yeah. then all of a sudden you got to watch a commercial maybe about Huawei, yeah. right? Well, so the, so the, you know, product placement. Imagine well. how tough it is to build a commercial that's compelling enough that it's not like skip ad, you know, fast forward through the PVR, like where people uh, will just watch it and not notice it, right? In Home Alone, they're drinking Pepsi throughout the... Yep. And I, and I noticed that right away. I'm like, they paid for product placement 25 years ago, and they're still getting purchase. Dividends. Dividends because of that product placement. Wasn't there a lot of that? Like, uh, Back to the Future had a lot of product placement, I think, didn't it? I think, again, oh, Pepsi yeah, they, was in Back to the Future. Had the Nike shoes, the self-tying Nike shoes that they, they came okay, out. Yeah. yeah, I think there was a bunch of that. Do they, is there, there much of that in movies? Anymore? DeLorean. Yeah, That's all it is now. Really? Oh, especially Transformers, where they like zoom in on the logo of the vehicles oh, as they drive by. Tr- true. Yeah. Yeah, that's oh, that's all they do. Yeah. It's Never like thought some, of that. Some shows is like all the like one show will be FBI and all the vehicles are Chevrolets, and a different show will be FBI and all the vehicles are Fords. And yeah. it's, okay, it's subtle, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every once in a while, when it's not subtle, I guess it jumps out at you. But uh, yeah, James Bond for sure they do it right. Omega watches, you know, the Aston Martin, and, all and that kind of wasn't stuff. that like. Has that always been in there though? Like because there's always his yeah. Aston Martin, right? Yeah, it's like, always. But I don't know if it was quite as commercially yeah. okay. focused. Somewhere along the line, someone figured it out and did it. Yeah. Well, I know now. Like you go into a watch shop and there'd be like the James Bond Omega Seamaster yes. thing, right? Yeah. Which I don't know. That's a little different. So. Yeah. Well, we're at forty minutes. Man. Oh man, that flew by, hey? Yeah. That's good. I think we can, we covered uh, a lot of ground. Yeah, well, it's, as long as we uh, you did, know. we miss anything, Dennis? Is there books. anything that we wanted we didn't to talk, talk about? Books. books. Okay, let's do three minutes on books. Go. Okay. I'm a Jack Reacher fan, so Lee Child. There's two movies on it. I just finished one of the books, Midnight Line. I'm reading the, the one actually is before it, called Night School. But yeah, this big military guy who's he's defended his country his whole life, but never lived in it, and so he retires, and now he's just traveling on buses around and. Uh, around his country and it's about these crime scenes and these uh, this military police um, was what he was doing in the uh, in the army but now he just goes around he has this very he's more of a vigilante but the just the way Lee Child writes it's very captivating and interesting Mm. Lee Child is the author Jack Reacher is the subject yeah. Mm. Okay. And he's got like 22 books now. Didn't I see a now. Jack Reacher yeah, movie? movie. Yeah, they had the, two movies. Tom the, Cruise. Tom Cruise. Which is actually the, the one thing that probably, Tom Cruise is perfect for the personality, but horrible for the stature. Because this guy's 6'5", blonde, <laughs> 250 pounds. not 5'2". <laughs> but, but Tom Cruise has the perfect personality for uh, the Jack Reacher. Yeah, uh, he's a good actor. They need one of the helm, like Chris, Hel- what's Chris the Hemsworth. Hemsworth. That's yeah. what I'm thinking of. Yeah, somebody like that stature, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Huh. Well, I'll have to look into those ones. So, an a t- an easy read, a tough read. How long to oh, blow it flows. through? Oh, it's hard to put it down. Um, I went through it in in a week, and that's with kids and spare time, spare time, few hours. Probably slept five hours a night, but right, <laughs> <laughs> reading the books at night. Yeah, I I uh, I don't read enough books, honestly. I I, uh, I read a lot of magazines. I read The Economist religiously, um, and that is a tough read you gotta you gotta work through the economist mm-hmm. um and then and then i'm working my tail off you know that's what's happening with me what books what uh, i do audio books because i bike uh, to and from work and uh, i work so what's your latest audio book? i am smashing through the ender series so oh, and, good. and there's ender games xenocide uh ender shadow i'm on shadow uh i just finished ender shadow and the next one is Shadow of the, uh, I can't remember the name of them. So who's the author? I, the, it's it, an audio book. You never it, I would author. have, it, there's probably people listening right now saying, yelling, yelling the guy's name right now, but uh, they made a movie of it. The movie was pretty good. And, yeah. and the book, the books are, they're, they're like awesome and then sort of good and then awesome and then sort of good. So, uh, but uh, sci-fi, because, is that what yeah, it is? Yeah, it's sci-fi. Yeah. It's sci-fi. Yeah. And it all depends because I do audio books. I can do about 20 a year, 20. 30 books a year just by listening. Audible? Uh, yes. Audible. That's the app, right? Audible? Uh, that's the app company, I yeah, think. Yeah. So I, I just smash through. It's uh, now, it's uh, unfortunately, but I, I call it passive listening because I could probably miss giant chunks where I'm like, ooh, I'm just biking along. It's like, what just happened? What am I listening to? <laughs> so it's not exactly. Wait, how did he get there? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then it's like, oh, okay, well, oh, whatever, keep going. 
Yeah, yeah. So you, you got it's a different style of taking in a book. Do you do audio books at all? Uh, I do podcasts. So I listen to like Freakonomics podcasts. Yeah. I listen to How I Built This. Um, okay. with an, it's an NPR podcast. Oh, and of course, uh, Source Points podcast. And I listen to Source Points when they put <laughs> them out every six weeks. Yeah, hey, sorry. Hey. Yeah. That's, that's appropriate, Dig. Chris has always given me hell for We should do it once a week, just, at least. It's, yeah, it's just the discipline to do that. Good. Well, let's uh, let's wrap it up. Sounds you want me good. to figure out how to get this thing going again? Absolutely. Please. Okay. All right, the outro here music. Here comes the outro. So, is it going? Uh, you need to anything. put the volume up, <sighs> usually. I can hear it. There we go. Oh, there you there go. it goes. All right. So that was the Source Points podcast. Uh, thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Chris. And I'm Alan Chatney. And I'd like to thank our guest, Dennis Ellison. Fantastic. Uh, until next time, keep rocking. <laughs>